on this week's episode of Bayou Wild TV. Attention to detail. We find it everywhere in nature, from beautiful landscapes, scenic rivers, colorful wildlife, and everywhere in between. We explore artistry in the outdoors as practiced by two Louisianians with a passion to preserve traditions passed down from those that came before us. Closed captioning made possible by Explore Kayak Adventure Company. Fishing, sightseeing to photography tours, everything to make your paddling adventure happen. See Explore Kayak Adventure Company on Facebook and Instagram. Every day, we strive to preserve traditions that have spanned generations. Around every turn of the bayou, Mother Nature reveals unique people, places, and experiences. And the bounty of animals and fish. Well, in Louisiana, we just call that land yak. I'm Don Dubuque. I'm Chris Lacombe. I'm Captain Martha Spencer. Join us as we document the adventure, sportsmanship, and heritage that make us Bayou Wild. Louisiana probably has the richest heritage of any state when it comes to decoy carving and collecting, and that's for a lot of reasons. We have more world champions in South Louisiana than anywhere else in the world. You know, it's, we got it licked. We got it under control. But decoy carving is a dying art. Once passed down through generations of hunters, the custom of hand-making duck decoys now is practiced by only a handful of Louisiana's outdoorsmen. I actually read an article almost 30 years ago in Louisiana Sportsman magazine by the guy, Mr. Ira Bordelon. Uh, just happened to contact him and just as friendly as he could be, called me over to his house, kind of pointed me in the right direction, gave me a block of wood and bada bang, uh, kind of knocked one out kind of fast, took it back to him, showed it to him, gave me another block of wood. This time it kind of gave me some good direction. And this is a little teal that I got to do with him. And again, I did this about 25 or so years ago. And I was very proud of it and wanted to continue doing it, but still kind of lost after just one bird. And then Mr. Ira passed away and I was lost again. You know, and until about four years ago. I really didn't think I'd ever compete in a show. And I, I compete as, a, as an amateur and as a novice. I mean, there's certain different categories that you compete in, all the way up to professionals. And uh, uh, my very first show that I got in, it was in La Rose. And uh, I showed a little green winged teal and a ruddy duck. And they won everything they could win. You know, best of show, best of species. Um, and I was kind of hooked in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alan considers himself lucky and fortunate for the opportunity to showcase his craft on a world stage. You went to Maryland to compete. A little out of your area, different birds, I'm sure, different species. And tell me about this bird, leading up to it, how long it took to make and what it did. I spent almost a year on this. And um, I carved it for my daughter. And when I took it to the world, I was so impressed. It's, um, when the guy held it up, that was it, <laughs> you know? It's a hell of a feeling. I mean, people from Russia, uh, Germany, uh, Alaska, Canada, certainly a lot of South Louisiana carved it. It took the world, I was uh, very proud of it.
I just took my time. Um, I repainted that bird two or three times. And again, you know, when I, when I have world champions looking over my shoulder, I got to change. I got to I gotta just try to make a little bit better and a little bit better. And again, I didn't start off doing decorative birds. I started off doing something very simple to kind of work your way up. I know you don't sell your ducks, but what would an award winning, maybe not necessarily the champion, but a ribbon winning bird, what would it sell for? Um, most of these guys around here, anywhere from three grand to it can go up to whatever, eight, 10, 12 grand. God, people offer me thousands of dollars for it. It's, it's just no way, you know. When I told them I carved that for my daughter, she cried more than I did. <laughs> but uh, my daughter's very special. To get full appreciation of the tedious work of a decoy carver, we tried our hand at carving from a rough wood block. You know, in duck calling, uh, champion duck callers, they'll tell you there's calling to kill ducks and there's calling for the judges. Is it the same with carving? Do you have some that you like to do a certain way that you like, but knowing what judges look for, you actually have to do something a little different? Um, yes, with, with decoratives, yes. Um, judges are very, very pickle, particular about what they want. And some judges prefer to see a lot of air under the wings. Some of them don't want to see as much air. Some of them um, uh, just don't like pintails. <laughs> you know, they'd rather see you carve something else, you know? And you know your bird's better. But you're looking at something else, you say, well, that's not near as good, but that's what the judge like. I spend about a year on a bird like this in that pintail and there's just so many layers of paint. Uh, the thing to do is always, if you want to be good at something, hang out with people that are better than you, and you'll learn a lot. Tell us about the woods that are used. Tupelo is primary. Tupelo is the main wood that we use. And there's only certain parts of the tree that you could use. You can't go all the way up the trunk and use it. You don't see very much grain in this wood at all. So you try to cut with the grain of the wood. You know, you're not battling on like this breast and whatnot. It'll give you a little trouble because the grain is going this way, and you're going to be kind of kind of cutting against the grain on that. But so, what do you love about carving? Relaxing. It just relaxes you, and then you create something that um, I've always seen other people's decoys, and just amazed at what they do with a piece of wood. It's like golf or anything else, fishing, music, whatever. You are just you're hooked. Oh, when we were kids, we we didn't go anywhere to hunt or fish. I mean, we stayed right here. You know, we stayed right here. We had the, the Chifuncta River, the Tanjapaho River, Bidico Creek, the lake. We grabbed a P-Row and a little flatboat, uh, just took off on foot and just started going. And the squirrels, the rabbits, the, you know, deer, whatever, it was there. It's probably gone on here in South Louisiana longer than any place else in the country. Uh, it's recognized more up in the north and northeast, eastern coast, but they found decoys here, you know, in South Louisiana, they're certainly older than the birds up on the East Coast. And uh, again, it used to be a family tradition down here. Everybody down the bayou, if your grandfather did it, you know, their son did it, and then their sons, and it's just not happening anymore. It's certainly turning into a dying one. Courtney Hammonds on behalf of the Louisiana Propane Dealers. I've spent hundreds of hours practicing piano. That preparation paid off when I won a couple of talent awards and the title of Miss Louisiana. The Louisiana Propane Dealers are also pretty talented and want you to be prepared for when the power goes out. Visit louisianapropane.com to find out about propane generators and other safety tips. Louisiana Propane, it truly is a fuel for our future. 
Here's how I guarantee my crawfish tastes great every time. I use Louisiana Fish Fry brand seafood boil. Why do the pros use Louisiana Fish Fry seafood boil? Because the flavor is so good. Louisiana Fish Fry seafood boil has more garlic, onion, paprika, lemon, and not too much salt. Louisiana Fish Fry brand seafood boil. Find the yellow bag and pour and boil for great crawfish every time. In 1967, Dutch Stagner realized his dream to run his own meat market. Fifty years and three generations later, Double D and the Stagner family still operate with Dutch's original commitment to quality. Pick up some Double D sausage today and share your good times with us on Facebook. We're here in La Ranger at the blacksmith shop of Kate Jenkins. You might be familiar with him. He's actually the winner of season seven's Forged in Fire for making some really nice knives. I'm Kate Jenkins. I'm from La Ranger, Louisiana, and I have been making handmade knives since I was about 12. And I started doing this when I was about 12 um, because my grandfather did it full time for, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, and I saw him doing it and I wanted to do it. It actually started by melting lead um, back like right behind us. Um, but uh, my, sooner or later my grandpa saw how interested in I was and what he was doing. And he gave me a forge and an anvil and um, I started same spot where my shop is built, right behind me. I signed him up for baseball, like t-ball. Yeah, like his first day at practice, he got hit in the head with a ball and came home crying. He didn't want to go back. That didn't work out. But like 4-H was families like us. And so people travel to ball tournaments. We traveled to shooting sports. And I like to, that he uh, associates with like his grandpa and his heritage. If you first take a look at my grandfather, he's got a long white beard, um, doesn't, I mean, you can't even tell if he's smiling, even if he is smiling, because his beard, he critiqued a lot. Every kid needs to find something they can be successful at. So this was his place where he could be successful and he could leave here feeling good about himself. I had the opportunity to be on the show Forged in Fire. There's four bladesmiths that go head to head in three rounds of knife making competition. In the end, there's two that go into a finale and they have to make like a full size sword and the winner is chosen and the winner wins $10,000. He talks like he knows a lot, but I don't know a lot about it. So when you get in that realm and there's other People who've been doing this for a long time, like, well, is he, is he really that good? I don't know. Um, I kind of went on to there actually, you know, <laughs> not, not, you know, having the expectation of I'm going to blow them away. It was more of an expectation of I'm just going to do the best I can, you know, and, and, and if it's not good enough, then it's not good enough. That's just, you know, kind of how God you know, intended it to be. Some people have more of a rough design. I'm really bad about not having a design in mind. And like, as I'm forging, I'm like, oh, you know, I need to, I need to think about this for a second. I can't tell you how many knives I've pulled out of a quench. You know, like it had a warp in it and I just wanted to bend it a little bit and I've popped it in my hands. You know, they break like glass. Um, I can't tell you how many times um, I glued on a set of handle scales and then dropped the knife 
and both of the handle scales popped off, you know, and it's, it's a trial and error thing and you learn what works and what doesn't, but stuff breaks all the time. There are some days he comes in and he's so frustrated and he'll do all that work and then he comes in and it fell apart and it didn't come out right. But that's life, you know, so he's learning all these life skills. None of my friends' brothers are blacksmiths. If he starts on a knife, then he will not quit. Like, he'll come inside and then for like five minutes and then come back outside. Like, for me, I like to sit down for like five hours and then I'll do something, but he's up and always on the go. Well, I've had, I had a order come in from Europe and Australia. I shipped an order to Canada about two weeks ago or something like that. We're making a knife kind of like this. Um, got a little shorter blade on it, but it's just a hunting, skinning, all around use knife. It's got a little bit of drop point on it. Handmade custom knives are not like a very common thing. Well, people come to me and they want something special. You know, they, they don't want what's in a store. And especially when you use a knife that often, so like certain, so like, um, you know, people who do a lot of hunting, um, chef's knives, um, you know, carving knives. A knife is a very, very, very old tool, evolved into so many different, you know, shapes and sizes, and they are so, so specialized. They want it a certain way for a certain reason and that's how they want it and so that's what I do I, I make it how they want it Paul can't swing the hammer anymore so all of these things that he has has some kind of story from his grandpa so you know having that Heritage, you know, that's just important. Like, be proud of where you come from. I, I'll never stop doing this, that's for sure. Um, I'm always gonna do it, but I love it when somebody comes to me and says, you make me a knife. Don't care what it is, don't what it looks like. I just want a beautiful knife. My name is James Loop and I won the uh, 2020 Chevy 1500. It was uh, first day at roughly 5, 36 o'clock in the evening. I was like, let's stay fishing. And she's like, ah, maybe we need to get back to the launch, you know? <laughs> yeah, I had a blast. It was a great summer tournament. Thank you, Super Chevy dealers, for my 2020 Silverado. We love our children. We protect them. We guide them. We prepare them for life in the world. With all that we do, from deep in our hearts, we cannot control all things. Life-threatening illnesses and disabilities affect far too many of our children each year. While we cannot change the circumstance, we can make dreams come true. Dreams to provide hope, to provide spiritual healing and strength, to provide moments of happiness and relief in the hardest of times. We can give a glimmer of light and hope in a time of darkness and despair. Join huntofalifetime.org to help make dreams come true, to provide hope for children with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Hunt of a Lifetime is a nonprofit organization fulfilling dreams for hunting and fishing trips to youth 21 and under with life-threatening illnesses and disabilities. Visit huntofalifetime.org to learn how you can make a difference.
Jeff, you know, one of the most versatile birds besides a chicken is a quail. Oh, you can definitely. almost do anything uh, with quail. Absolutely. What is one of your favorites? Well, I, you know, uh, many years ago, I was doing a book called uh, uh, Plantation Celebrations. And I, I found this old plantation house uh, uh, outside of Ponchatoula, and it was called the Botoff Plantation Home. I had never heard of it, but I meandered into the driveway that day with my crew, and, uh, you know, as we always do, knock on the door, they're either going to shoot us or they're going <laughs> to feed us, you know. <laughs> so, so I went in, and I, I said, look, I said, uh, uh, somebody was telling me that the Botaw family had this great quail recipe, and I'm doing a search on recipes from different areas of uh, Louisiana, and y'all name came up a couple of times about this quail recipe, and I said, uh, I didn't know if you'd be interested in sharing it with me. I'm doing a cookbook. I'd give you all the credit and everything else, and they said, uh, oh, yeah, we, 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 we'd love to do it. But what I'm going to do here, in fact, is I'm going to let you start this. Um, what I do, again, I... I love to use some of the flavored sausages in some of my stuffings, most of my game stuffings. You see me do that often where I'll use the Italian sausages or the, or the onion sausages. And there's so many great sausages available in the stores. Why just throw ground meat in? Just go ahead and get some of those good flavors. At the same time, I'm going to put a, a little bit of butter in there. You don't mind, huh? No. Oh, butter no. Butter is good. Butter is good. <laughs> butter, butter is good and quail are great. So when those two things go together, you know what you have. Now in your skillet, I browned the, uh, uh, the sausage and I just kind of rendered that fat that has all of that great flavor in it. The butter's gonna add the creaminess to it. And of course, again, onion, celery right here, bell peppers. I always like to put color. Put color in your food, guys. That people eat with their eyes first. And then of course, that wonderful garlic, right? Uh, the more garlic, the better. Make you live longer, you know what I mean, Don? That's what I hear. Okay, so again, we're making a great stuff, and now I'm gonna put a little herbs in here, a little basil, a little thyme. Of course, you know, you can put just put your normal green onions and parsley. That's gonna be just as good right there. And now we will just continue to simmer that and let all of those flavors come together. In fact, Don, you can put one ladle of that uh, nice uh, stock. And again, you can buy all kinds of stocks in the store today, the beef stocks, the chicken stocks, even game stocks are coming into the store now. So I'll just use water, just keep some of those uh, in, the, in the skillet. Now while you're stirring that, let's take a look at the quail for a minute. Uh, nice bird, nice breast. Take a look at that, how beautiful that breast is. Uh, one of the top uh, dishes in my restaurant is death by gumbo, which is a, a stuffed quails. And people love it, and I think most people come to the restaurant comes because of that, uh, that quail dish. The good thing about that recipe is it was one of the first times that, uh, that the bird was actually brine. There was a nice brine that went into it as well. And uh, the cooked seasonings that went inside the bird stuffed the little legs really properly tied. Made a beautiful plate presentation on the, uh, on the dish. And when this starts to break down really good, I'm going to add some cooked rice to it. So, you know, that, that, now that, that could just be your rice dressing on the side good. of anything, but instead, that's gonna be the stuffing for the quail. So you see you have a classic rice dressing. Uh, once that's done, I cool it, and then I'll put it in one of these pastry bags because this makes it real easy. And you see the, see the texture of it when it's, coming, mm -hmm. when it's coming out of that. You see that's all of the stuff that's just, but once it's done, I'm gonna go into a roasting pan with them, a little butter, a little oil, just kind of brown them off nicely. And uh, when you come back, we're gonna show you what it looks like. Quail's underutilized. Not enough people eat quail. I think it's one of the best little uh, dishes in the world. It's elegant. It, it was always served on the on the table of the kings. It was always served on served at the White House by most of the presidents. It's the perfect size. The meat is yeah. not gamey at all, but yet it is game. Just gotta so, clean up after yourself when you're yeah, finished. Yeah, <laughs> otherwise you make game you know. I don't do that anymore. I'm sorry, Botox, you know. <laughs> One of the reasons why Double D has been around for 50 years is because we are consistent with what built the business. And we go to great lengths to make sure that when you bring a deer or a hog or whatever it may be, your meat stays your meat all the way through the process. But we want to be as true to the original intent, which is a local meat company. And, and that's something that we want to maintain for as long as the Lord lets us do it.
I've got an interesting story on, on this decoy right here, and if you look at it, it's really out of place. It's out of its league among some of these that you see here. It's pretty primitive, but this is an actual hunting decoy from Afghanistan, and there's a, an interesting story that goes behind it. Uh, it was a friend of mine, uh, Coach Gibbs, who passed away. Uh, he had a couple of sons, Lewis and, and Rob, who were avid hunters. Uh, Rob went off and ended up serving in Afghanistan as a sergeant first class over there. And one day I got a letter from him and he said that he and his buddies from the Louisiana unit had been stationed over there. And one of the things they missed about home was news about hunting and fishing because they were all outdoorsmen. And he asked if there was any way I could send him a cassette tape, because that's what it was. It was before digitalization, we were still using cassettes, to send one over there so that he and his friends could listen to it every week. And to thank me for that, I got this in the mail one day. He shipped me this really working Afghani decoy. And as you can see, it's primitive, it's made out of wood, they, they burned it instead of painting it. And he told me over there there's very few laws regarding waterfowl or any birds. I mean, they pretty much hunt at will. It's hard to find good shotguns and they use blunderbusses and shrapnel and that. But this one really, of, of all the decoys I've owned and have, this one probably has the most meaning to me. We share the appreciation of taking something raw, dedicating time and hard work to making it beautiful and sharing that beauty with others. Louisiana is a unique place where tradition is valued among those who grew up in it. It is so important to keep these traditions alive through new generations. It's what makes the adventure, sportsmanship, and heritage a unique and special Bayou Wild Louisiana.